We live in an era in the early 21st century where the elites of the industrial world are evil people. Uh, quite generally so, and where the top universities of, of the world, especially American universities, generate evil people. Um, I'm not here to blame anybody. I'm just saying that it's obvious that that's happening. Uh, it couldn't be more evident with at least 13 to 20 trillion dollars lost in the middle classes of the industrial world due to the theft of those elites trained by the top 10 universities in the world. It couldn't be more obvious that these are evil people. Uh, socially sanctioned, civilizationally institutionalized thieves. Um, but what I'm interested in is how you tell truths like that and why colleges or best colleges don't tell truths like that. Where is truth? Where did it go? And, uh, you know, promotion, advertising, career, building ourselves, empowering each other, getting ahead, success, all those buzzwords and all that stuff. And truth is not a part of any of that. Apparently, you don't need any truth to get ahead, to be a success and do all of that. Uh, and this disconnect is part of the fundamental, fundamental, fundamental problem. It's how civilizations die. Uh, you sort of cash in the group and civilization for the sake of individual third homes and third boats and wealth building. And then uh, within 100 or 200 years, you have hundreds of millions of people poor for the next thousand years. This has happened again and again in history, and only fools don't realize that it can happen to us. Where is truth? Where is it hiding? Well, it's found in comedy, although the scale of modern comedy is uh, inadequate for our, our realities and our truths. It's found in history. It's found in philosophy. It's found in fiction. It's found in culture. And these things called the liberal arts, comedy, history, fiction, philosophy, and culture, these are the liberal arts. And this is where we tell truths. We don't tell truths in the social sciences and, the, and in the professions and in engineering, and nor in arts and humanities. But we do tell it in the liberal arts. Uh, comedy is where we look at the immense gap between our pretensions and our egoist self-promotings and our monkey-like realities. Comedy is about that gap, exposing that gap, naming that gap, measuring that gap and its consequences. It's in this deflating pomposities, arrogances, and religions of leadership and religions of success. Deflating that crap is a primary function of comedy. Without it, you can't see reality at all. History. We shiver at the flaw and evil in other people in bygone ages because none of them were alive to know that we're criticizing them and hurt our career or our funding. We don't do this with living people because we're afraid of impact on their career and funding. Professors in business schools, for example, are completely disallowed to criticize major corporations. Uh, if they do, then it's harder for the deans to raise money from the corporations and their alumni. And so you are told to sort of tone it down, they say, tone it down a little. Don't mention that the son of the chairman of Motorola has uh, pro, uh, presided over eight to 12 years of huge, huge losses and the selling off of immense businesses that used to be successful when daddy ran them, but the son, <laughs> totally unprepared to be a competent business person, but loved by daddy, has ruined the business. You can't say that because uh, we may need some money from the son just before he loses it all. Fiction, the power of fiction. You can say truer truths more accurately, describing people better than anything else on earth does. But if formally it's a fictional character with a different name and some different nominal details, you get away with it. And we all agree to this uh, agreement that uh, if you change the nominal details and if you say it's a fictional, then you can say truer things about people than anybody's really allowed to say in any other part of society. Fiction is a primary vehicle for truth telling. <laughs> Philosophy. We all bandy about words like leadership, success, creativity, debts and loans finance, competition, customer satisfaction, as if the meaning of the words is obvious. 
and as we as if, as if we all have the same image when we use these words. Philosopher is where we reveal not any truth. We don't get any direct truth from philosophy. Where we reveal the absence of truth in how we use words and language in normal discourse. Philosophy is the revealing of emptiness. Everything philosophy says about the philosophy of mind, for example, the last thousand years, uh, up to uh, Searle and Fodor, has been completely wrong. And every time we do, we get better instrumentation, like fMRI machines, we find out that the brain is much more interesting and sophisticated and totally differently arranged than uh, philosophers of mind ever talk about. So their content about the mind and how it works is totally always wrong. And that's for every branch of philosophy. Uh, but what philosophy does do is reveal that the things we think have meaning and the meanings we think they have are empty, actually, of meaning. So it's a pruning discipline. It prunes away the illusion of shared meaning from the way we use language and reveals the partiality and phoniness of the meanings that are actually used uh, when we think we're talking about something coherent. Culture is a liberal art. Most colleges don't teach it because they are confused about defining liberal arts, but when we attribute something to the culture of a person or a culture of their gender or culture of their nation, we get them off the hook. And we turn individual blame and responsibility into group blame and responsibility. It sort of dissipates it, takes the sting out for the individual. And therefore, the anthropology of uh, the causes of an issue or a problem or a failing uh, is a way to tell truths. Well, this man treated this group of people in a horrible way that destroyed their lives, but all men do that in a, in a way because of the hormones that control them most of their life. It's the culture of maleness operating in this person. And so culture is a primary way where we can tell truths about the horror of an individual while pretending that the individual didn't know that. Actually, how many men know the flaws of their own gender and manage them? Very few. So how can we blame this guy for being an idiot like all other male idiots? And then finally, delivering truth to power. Comedy, if you tell a good joke about how selfish and evil a vice president is, and if it's accurate, and if it's really beautifully expressed in words that make people really, really laugh at the accuracy and truth of it, it will spread around a corporation faster, farther, and more completely than any other message type known to humankind. And within three days, 10,000 people will be laughing at what a perfect, accurate rendition of the hidden evil and narcissism of that bombastic SOB that is. And you can destroy the respect for a vice president forever with one accurate good joke that captures the bad deal in their personality and in their career building. And uh, it's wonderful because then forever after what they say and do, if it picks up on details of your joke, just makes everybody shake their head. Here he goes again. Here he goes again. The same bad deal one more time regurgitated. Uh, it's an immensely satisfying form of revenge of the little people against the big people. And it works because it completely forever detaches respect from that performance and leaves uh, everyone in the audience perfectly clear that this guy is pretending to values that actually privately he undermines and destroys. Uh, and you can't escape it. The truthness of it makes it inescapable. The accuracy of it uh, makes it inescapable. Similarly, history. You can tell the history of a past era so beautifully and accurately in terms of it makes it perfectly clear we're reliving that right now, but different set of names in those roles, that People forget you're talking about 100 years ago, and they think you're talking about these five people now that are wrecking our a group. And that analogy power, if you set it up right with your words, is inescapable. And people repeat that history, and everybody knows they're talking about now and those five people. And that five people can deny all they want, but everybody sees the analogy. It's absolutely right on, spot on, and you can't escape the truth of it, the truth power of it. If you make a fictional story about the Wango, the Ducky Ducky, and the Biggie Bop, the uh, Platypus, and uh, here's how the Ducky Ducky and the Platypus interacted, and if it captures the reality of somebody or some policy perfectly enough, then uh, people will repeat that story pretending all the while that it's a story 
and everybody in the organization will know it's about these two dichotomies. Philosophy. If you develop a philosophy of loans and debt in our company or leadership and success in our uh, business, and if you define these as they are actually done, if you define them truthfully, your philosophy will reveal the delusional, distorted, uh, drenched with male hormone and lies and exaggerations from competition and career forces, truth of things, so that the words everyone thinks mean this actually just mean this other stunted stuff. And your little philosophy story of, in our place, this is what debt and loans are. In our place, this is what success and competition are. Uh, becomes preferred. It becomes the preferred viewpoint of everybody. And they just translate the lies and exaggeration constantly generated by the hormone machine into that's what's really being said. And it's pretty pitiful. Uh, people hear the actual definitions and instead of the exaggerated baloney conformist definitions. And a VP can't undo it. You can't undo it once people see beyond the distortions. Uh, when he uses the word success, uh, it means uh, you guys pretending you're leaders while he rips off everybody of $20 million a year for taking credit for luck and avoiding credit for bad luck as the economy goes up and down. That's what he defines success as. You define success as making a serious contribution to improving the organization. That's because you're middle class, naive, and stupid. He defines success as getting a whole bunch of people, dumb people like you to do that while he's got this other definition. Um, cultures. Uh, again, a primary way, if you look at the flaws of all the cultures that intersect in a person or in an incident or an event, and you explain the incident or event as the intersection of those cultures interacting. Uh, you can do two things. You can show that every individual involved is a blind tool of the cultural forces inside of them and not an adult, basically a 12-year-old in a 50-year-old body. And you can show that replacing that 12-year-old in a 50-year-old body with a different, better 12-year-old in a 50-year-old body isn't going to change very much. And you can see that we need adults in the world and not uh, 12-year-old minds and 50-year-old bodies. 